All right, in this last chapter, we're going to be talking about some, like I said, some odd things. It's kind of an odd chapter to stick in the end there about applications of social psychology, but it does make sense because um, the outcome of the planet that we live on does depend upon a lot of social factors. Um, so what we'll, we'll talk about it. It's very interesting. Um, the first thing, of course, is uh, the whole global warming thing. You know, some of you believe it, some of you don't believe it, but it's one of those things where um, even if you don't believe it, you ought to modify your behavior as though it were true because the potential consequences of the truth of it are so incredibly large that, um, boy, you know, let's let's say this. Um, there are always costs to mistakes. There's a cost, and we talked about this, in fact, like in terms of helping. Remember that? There are costs involved of being too cautious and costs of being too vigilant or something. Remember, it's like if you go to help somebody and they don't need help, you're embarrassed. But if you don't help somebody and they do need help, they die. Remember, one has humongous consequences, one has small consequences. They're both errors. Well, we, we could have two errors in here. We could have global warming and ignore it. Or we could have no global warming and we react to it as though there is global warming. And it's like that helping behavior example. There's these two errors. One has a, a, a humongous consequences. One has eh, trivial consequences. I'd much rather uh, err on the side of caution in this case. It is the world we live in, the world for my children. Well, anyway, let me let me put, the, put it this way. Um, we die, right? I mean, sorry, you knew that, right? And uh, at some point, why do I care? I mean, the day after I die, I mean, if the world collapses the day after I die, what do I care? I'm dead, right? Why, why would I care about something that happens after my life is over? And so let's look at some of the, some of the reactions that I found on the Internet. These are comments posted by a actual Internet, uh, you know, people on the Internet. Why do we care what happens to the planet? Because someday I will die and go to heaven and meet God. Then I will be able to say thanks for all the blessing you gave me in my life. God, they were awesome, especially that planet Earth with some amazing natural phenomenons. Like the way the sun gets really big on the horizon sometimes when it is setting and makes the mountains orange and pink and the way an eagle floats so slowly down to its nest that you think it isn't real and that bolt of lightning I saw it that looked like a strip of bacon in the sky that time in the desert and the whale that flashed his tail for me, even the bear that scared us from our camping trip and the hot sand under my feet and the cool grass. I could lay in to look up at a beautiful blue that only you could create. But then I will have a deep need to give something to him in return as a thank you. That's when I will tell him that I tried to take care of his gifts the best I could and try to to help others realize that it's not all just about us humans. Okay? So that's an interesting thing. Why do we care? I mean, you're dead. What's the, what's the point? You know? And this is an interesting thing. It's a, it's an obligation, right? You were given a gift and the goal, you have to return the favor. Okay? Okay. It's a social obligation. Here's a couple of other responses. It's mainly for the children. It would be incredibly selfish of anyone to think that so long as they had enough to... Enough cake to eat, polar bears to see, clean water to drink, and my house wasn't underwater, that it doesn't matter what happens to others. I got it, okay? And so, again, we talked about um, the, 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 remember, oh, what was it? Equ not equity theory. Um, uh, social exchange theory, that we do things, and look at this. This person is taking care of the planet only because they, they feel guilty if they don't, okay? And so it's an avoidance of guilt situation for this person. Two kids, one grandchild so far. I'm a very protective mother. I want my kids to enjoy their lives. They're young adults now and just hitting stride. As for the three-year-old, we had a nice learning lesson on grasshoppers the other day. I didn't use the word food chain, but we talked about what they eat and what eats them. So it's partly selfish. I want to help take care of the planet so my family will enjoy a good life. And partly because caring is the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do. I like that. I can't imagine not caring. It just isn't in my nature. And hopefully, by enjoying all kinds of life lessons with my grandchild or children, I'll pass along my love of life and nature to them. So look at that. She even admits it's selfish. Okay? It's selfish because I want my children to have it. Okay? 
We don't live forever, just like 70 years or something. If we don't take care of our natural resources, what will happen in the next generation? Our sons, the sons of our sons. We care about it so that the next people who will be living on this planet will also enjoy what we enjoy now. If your parents or grandparents destroyed the forest, seas, and all the natural resources, we wouldn't have anything left to see. The beauty Mother Earth has made. I hope this clarifies your question. Thank you. Okay? So, clearly, we do have selfish motives, even though this is something that is going on beyond the span of our lifetime. Okay? That's interesting. Um... Oh, here, I guess I have one more. Yeah, we are selfish, but the reason we care for the planet is because we're afraid of the idea of what would happen if something went terribly wrong. Sounds like my whole uh, uh, better air on the side of caution thing. We tend to think about the future of ourselves or of life in general. Not tending for the planet completely would show how lazy we are capable of being. <laughs> you know, I don't look lazy, right? <laughs> Maybe we won't live forever, but do you want to spend your life living in industrial sewage? As planets go, the day will come when his this one shakes us off like a bad case of fleas. Until then, I'd like to see the Rockies without a brown haze. <laughs> it is very apparent that we don't really care or else we would not be using vehicles that cause pollution. And that is just one example of our abuse of the environment. Okay, that one isn't quite as insightful. But... We see this is an interesting thing because um, in the research that I do, I study discounting and I talk about, um, you know, what happens uh, to the value of a reinforcer or, or, or a, a reward as it gets delayed in time. You know, like um, if I say, I'm going to give you $20 and you're like, yeah, it's worth $20. But if I say, I'm going to give you $20 in five years, and you're like, oh, shit, give me two bucks. I would trade that promise from you, you know. And so... I, uh, in my research, I study the value of how, or, or how things lose value with time. And this is a really interesting example because in some ways, you know, here, I'm going to give you $20, but you won't receive it until the day after you die. What's it worth to you? And you're like, nothing. It has zero value to me because I'm dead. Okay. So clearly people are thinking about the planet that they live on in a way which is different from that $20. I mean, it's not a purely economic relationship here because it does in some way or another retain value beyond your lifetime. All right. A promise of $20 that you get the day after you die has zero value to you. It's gone effectively. It's, it's called a time horizon. It's effectively just gone. It has nothing. Yet the value of a, of a clean planet somehow exists to you beyond where you end and so that's kind of a cool one and so here's a uh, make you feel bad kind of graph um the total ecological footprint this is this is this little graph here we see that uh, on the along the bottom is is the years and along the left side is the number of earths that we're consuming okay <laughs> if you can imagine um, this is earth's carrying capacity we talked about uh, carrying capacity when it came to the the uh, the fish and the the fishing up in Newfoundland and the carrying capacity of the uh, of the land when we talked about the literally the tragedy of the commons in in reference to the actual sheep grazing and so clearly we've got the same type of a tragedy of the commons going on if by commons we not refer to a specific thing such as the number of fish in the fishing grounds or something but instead if we refer to a a more global generic um resources consumed or something and so each and every one of us realize that everybody would be better off if we all used less but just like with tragedy of the commons or even the iterated prisoner's dilemma the absolute best outcome is if i use as much as i damn well please and you limit your your use now wouldn't that be the best outcome the absolute suckers outcome remember the suckers pay off i limit my resource uses and i control myself but other people don't, okay? And I mean, I'm guilty of this myself. I know this, because I mean, I have no desire. I mean, this is what I say anyway. I mean, I think there's a truth to it. I do not want to um, buy a big car. I don't. I mean, I, 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 my current vehicle, it's going to be dead pretty soon. I can just, I can tell it's to the point where the cost of repairing it is starting to exceed it, what it would be worth to repair. But anyway, I, I, I'm like, I just want to buy a little, small, cheap 
$10,000 car, something I can zip back and forth to work and won't absolutely kill my um, savings account, you know, something like this. But you know what? Then I look at that effing Hummer that somebody has, and I'm like, I, I have to buy a big car, only because there's that Hummer out there. Somebody else is forcing me to consume more, because otherwise that's the sucker's payout. They're driving this great big Hummer and putting my ass in in, 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 in peril, and I am. And if I'm driving a small car, that's a sucker's payout in this kind of a game, okay? And so I'm being forced to avoid the sucker's payout. Now I, I am not. I have no desire to be the one that drives a Hummer while everybody else drives a Metro. But you know, I mean, you get the idea. So I, because I'm afraid of the sucker's payout, I ain't gonna buy a small car, okay? So it's it's an interesting interesting game here. Here's a uh, very interesting one. If you're running the PowerPoint slideshow, um, not just on your screen, but I mean, if you literally are running slideshow and then you click on the picture here, it will pull up the uh, National Geographic article um, that, that's about this. And it really, it explains global warming in a way um, that is down to earth, that is very simple. It's a, it's a few years old, but it explains it in a way um, <clears throat> that... That answers a lot of the challenges that a lot of deniers. Um, I, I think that I, I did my I said my part on this, but I mean I want to repeat that there are there are two potential mistakes here: being overly cautious and reacting to something that isn't true, or killing our entire planet. I mean, I, I, if I had to make one of those mistakes, which mistake would I rather be? I think I'd much rather be overly cautious. I mean, that just seems to be the, the obvious choice. Okay. So it, check this out. It is interesting because it, it helps you to understand a little bit, not just where does this carbon coming in from. It also, the article helps to explain why having carbon heats up the earth. And it also explains where that carbon goes and what would happen, how long it would take. And it also gets into um, when was the last time. You know, I know that people are like, um, there's fluctuations in the carbon. Oh, well, there is, there is, there is. But um, it. it as you can read in this article, at least for the last 800,000 years, they have uh, air bubbles that are trapped in ice in Antarctica, and they can analyze the uh, parts per million of carbon in there. And uh, at least for the last 800,000 years, there has never been carbon at the level we're at. I mean, never, okay? There's no way to know exactly when it was, but in the last 800,000 years, it's never been up anywhere near where we're at, okay? So it, at least longer than that. Well, whatever. Well, move on. Um, clearly, um, it, it, again, it's, it's our selfish human nature, and I mean, I, I, I understand this, I mean, look at this picture here, here's another kind of depressing one, here is the population of the earth, and you see along here, um, on the far, on the left side, we see just a few people, and we move our way up into the, what are we at, seven, eight, I don't know, what am I at, ten, what about, somewhere around, I can't read it, six billion, something like that, six billion, billion on earth you look at the line at this point okay the line on this graph it isn't even there's a, there, there's no slope to this line if anybody remembers rise over run there's no slope it's flat up it's straight up in the air wait is that is that no slope no no slope is this one so that's what a slope of oh i guess that'd be a, just a really high slope wouldn't it almost an infinitely high slope gosh i'd have to pull my math out again but anyway um we're having an exploding population, and I'll tell you what, you know, China is, is China and India both, I mean, they both got well over a billion people, and I'll tell you what, right now, China has, um, let's just pick 1.2 billion people, something like that, and of their 1.2 billion people, they only have about 100 million that would qualify as a economic class that was anything like America. Okay, so that means they have 1.1 billion people living in poverty. Well, China is working very hard to get those 1.1 billion people out of poverty. Now, just imagine if China does exactly. I mean, and they're having they're having economic growth that's going to make this possible, which means they're going to have 1.1 billion people driving cars. Holy shit! Okay, so we got to be aware of this stuff. I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, here it's here it is. I'm like in this dilemma. I'm like, I want to have my car. And, in fact, I would argue I don't have a choice because DFW is just not designed for it, right? I mean, you can't live here and not have a car. But at the same time, I don't want them to have one, right? I mean, 
You ride your bicycle. I'll drive my car. All right? Now, that seems fair to me. Okay? Not only that, but our increasing consumption. Um, our throwaway society. You know, um, and it's just the way it is. You know, oh, the, my shirt. All right. From a simplest, simplest, simplest perspective. If your sock has a hole in it, what do you do with it? You throw it out. If grandma's sock had a hole in it, what did grandma do? She sold it. I mean, come on. How much simpler than that can you get? And now extend that same idea out to every product that we own, okay? I mean, even our washing machines, our durable goods are not durable anymore. Um, they're just designed to wear out. They're just designed to be exchanged. However, we are modifying ourselves. Obviously, we are. Things like these new light bulbs, which which are, you know, I mean, it's it's, it's trivial, but I mean, there's, there's an understanding that, you know, um, we can. It's the small things that do. The efficiency of appliances are amazing. Um, let's say I, uh, I replaced my air conditioning unit uh, a couple of years ago, and all of a sudden, my electric bill dropped by like 30%. Just like that. Why? Because it was just a more efficient appliance. All appliances are, are um, increasing in efficiency in this way. Okay. Um, clearly, I mean, we're moving towards a society where some of this stuff is disappearing. Right? Car mileage is getting less. Um, there have been some amazing numbers put, um, challenges put onto the car manufacturers that they must meet certain miles per gallon limits for certain vehicles. But there's always problems with that. But new, new, we're, we're coming up with new and innovative ways. I mean, um, wind energy. I've seen some interesting articles about um, the use of solar kites. Okay, the uh, solar kite to launch uh, wind turbines. Okay, so uh, that you can take advantage of the solar winds to blow the wind turbines to create energy. And I'm like, dude, that is so cool because guess what? It the wind is always at top speed. It never slows down. Unlike up on the prairies, you have a constant source of energy, which is always available, not just spotty at best, which is wind energy. Um, we're getting better at solar technology, all right? The whole, um, it's becoming more and more common, especially in, in countries such as Europe, that you just put solar tech on your roof. It's just what you do. That's how you build a roof, you know? Um, there are new technologies. I mean, we as humans are, are amazing at what we are discovering, okay? We're finding ways to grab that carbon. Maybe that whole carbon bathtub thing. Maybe this thing is something that, that may be a moot point. God, I hope so. I hope so. But they're finding ways to, say, for example, um, recapture the carbon from the air and put it underground, okay? And store it back into those places that you took the fossil fuels out of in the first place. Because those things used to be full of something. Now they're not full of anything. So guess what? If you can recapture that carbon and pump it down into there under enough pressure, it liquefies and refills that space. Okay? It's already it's a space that's there, right? I mean, you emptied it, so you can fill it, right? But we're we're getting some amazing things. There are social phenomena like cap and trade, um, which is got some limited uses. Got some limited uses. It it's it's a way basically to put an economic incentive on pollution. Uh, the problem is, of course, that um, just like in the prisoner's dilemma or 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 the um, tragedy of the commons, there's always an econ there's always an incentive for me to maximize my output. Remember, the fisher dude is like, I know I can catch 500 pounds of fish. That's my daily limit. But if I catch 600, that extra 100 will buy my wife that vacation she wants. Remember that whole thing, the whole selfish thing. Well, by uh, incentivizing pollution, that is to say, not just uh, fining those people that pollute too much, but by literally paying a premium to people that pollute less than, then all of a sudden we, we find that by incentivizing and turning into an economic game, people respond to that. That, I mean, if you want an incentive to drive people's behavior, you just, you, you put money out there. All right. Um, I'll, this here, this comes from, economics 101 but uh, this is really behavioral economics okay so this is this is definitely uh, this is right up the alley of where, where my uh, degree comes in um, products uh, often have a demand which is con well I mean it's there's something called elasticity of demand 
That is to say, it's a continuum. Elasticity is a continuum. And on one extreme, you have elastic demand. And on one extreme, you have inelastic. Elastic demand is demand such that um, a large change um, in demand as the price changes. And inelastic means the opposite. What does that mean? Let's say, for example, um, something with inelastic demand. Let's say I like, in fact, the most inelastic demand there is for me involves breakfast cereals and uh, soda. All right. Guess what kind of soda I drink? Whatever was on sale this week. All right. That is the ultimate in elastic demand. Okay. And if soda went up in price too much, I would just switch out and I would start to drink iced tea. I mean, I would just, I would just switch to something else. That's elastic demand. Inelastic demand is is demand for a product such uh, a product with a uh, very inelastic demand would be something like heroin. Okay, because to a heroin addict, there's really no substitute. Okay, so if the price of heroin doubles, a heroin addict is still going to buy heroin. They they don't they don't stop their consumption of heroin. They don't switch to another product. Right? They just they pay the price. That's what inelastic demand is about. And um, in, in many cases, we find that. Um, the elasticity of demand is an interesting thing as um, our wants. In fact, here, this is this is a good moral lesson for you. As, as, a, as a daddy, this is the one I, I have to teach my kids constantly. What you want and what you need are not the same thing. Okay, A want is something which has elastic demand. A need is something which has inelastic demand. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. And, um, and so, therefore, what you need is inelastic and, therefore, even when the price goes up, and that price could involve how much work you have to do for it, or how many dollars you have to spend, or a lot of factors, right? Um, we find though that um, gasoline was 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 always put out as the thing with the, the most inelastic demand. But n when the price of gas gets high, we find that actually Americans have responded in a way that it's not normal. Um, because we, we thought it was inelastic, and it's true to a large degree, to a large degree. I mean, I don't have a choice about, you know, I have to go to work. I have to go back and forth. It's DFW, all right? You have to do certain things. But what we find is when the price of gas gets too high, people find ways. They start to carpool more. We find that when the price of gas goes up too much, um, they people tend to schedule, let's say, they stop for all of their errands on the way home from work rather than making a special trip. Or they they scrub that family vacation that they were going to take. You know, they were going to drive to the Poconos or something. So clearly, demand isn't completely inelastic. As I said, there is a in there is an elasticity as a a continuum with these two being the extremes. Uh, but I really like this notion of wants versus needs. I like that. I, I've never thought about that before. Another one we need to consider is utilitarianism. Um, we are living in a society where um, you use hairspray, you know, the kind in the can, and uh, it pops a hole in the ozone layer over South America and increases the uh, skin cancer rates to a group of pygmies that are living there. It's like, dude, serious? Yeah. <laughs> Done. Okay. Well, utilitarianism is a, a moral philosophy, basically. Um, it's an economic philosophy too, but really, it's a it's a, a decision making philosophy. A this notion that all decisions, in a, in a, some kind of a moral sense, you should consider the consequences of every single person that is involved, or, or not just person. I mean, it could, it could go even further. It could go to animals or the planet in general, right? But we need to consider the um, all of the consequences of our actions, all, not just the consequences to me, okay? If I um, drive my car, if I buy a Hummer, the consequences to me are big payments and lots of gas. But guess what? There's consequences to other people. The price of gas goes up for everybody because you're consuming more. The price of you know raw materials goes up higher because you use twice the raw materials to build your vehicle. The pollution involved is you know blah 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 right. So we need to think about these consequences or. Uh, you buy a pair of Nikes, you know, you go, oh, Nikes, and the consequences are, I paid $700, I don't know what the hell you pay for Nikes, but I've heard some crazy shit, um, and what are the consequences? They make me look cool, and make me feel good, 
Yeah, but what about the other consequences? What about the dude, the little kid in Malaysia who just made three cents and was, you know, beaten severely because he didn't tie the laces properly in the shoe as it went in the box or something, you know? That's all got to be part of our decision-making process. And I'm not getting all high and mighty because I admit I'm guilty too. I mean, if you looked at my shirt, I bet you it says made in Guatemala. Oops, I heard it was Guatemala. I can't really pronounce it. I can't read it. Can you read it? I don't know. Okay, you tell me. I got it from UT Arlington, so you tell them, okay? Um, because everybody's happiness counts. Everybody's not just yours. Okay. Um, we are finding ways to reduce consumption. Clearly, China's one-child policy has been uh, with mixed results. It has gotten the job done. It has gotten China's population under control. At what cost? Well, that's a whole other question altogether, okay? But they have definitely found something that does something over there. Um, we also find that our population is being controlled in many ways because um, the general educational level, in, in, in America for sure, but around the world too, but mostly here, um, education level is rising, especially for women, and uh, we know that uh, with more education, women tend to have fewer children and tend to start having them later. So we're, we're, we are entering a realm where we're controlling our own population in many ways, um, the need for a large, large family because you uh, have a farm or something is no longer no longer there. So we also are finding that um, different policies are being put in place to moderate consumption. Um, let's say public policies to moderate consumption like um, rewarding carpooling or uh, tax breaks for hybrids or something like that. Um, social movements can make a trend towards, you know, like say for example... We're, um, um, I, I tell you this, I mean, if I, if I watch one of you, you kids, um, uh, taking your plastic bottle and just dump it into the garbage can outside the classroom door, I'm going to give you the evil stink eye, okay? I admit, Wesleyan has shit facilities for recycling, embarrassing, in this, in this age and era, it's embarrassing how uh, Wesleyan's recycling facilities are, however, there is something. There is stuff out there, and I will give you the evil stink eye if you put that stuff in that uh, in that trash can. Okay. So there are social costs nowadays to not recycling. It's a, it's a trend. I mean, uh, the new the younger generation. I don't know how many of you are part of the younger generation, but the younger generation thinks differently. When I was a kid, the term recycle didn't really exist. Recycling meant going to the park on Saturday morning after Friday night. And finding all of the aluminum beer cans so that you could sell them for 30 cents a pound and make money to buy something. You know, that was a Saturday trip with my ma. You know, we would go to the park and, and pick aluminum cans out of the dumpster so that we could sell them and make our money. And it was like, okay, it was it was a nice day. It was it was an excuse to go to the park, okay? We weren't freaks. Um, things like cigarette taxes are being used to moderate consumption as well. Um... There's, uh, you know, here in America, the price of cigarettes. When I was when I was growing up, we I used to, I I was a smoker. I know, <laughs> and uh, I used to be able to get cigarettes for eight dollars a carton. Uh, going up to the I guess it was a Menominee Indian um, reservation up in uh, near Green Bay, and uh, it was like eight bucks a carton when you drive up there. You know, you're like what the hell. You know, it's worth a trip up there. You you buy five cartons, forty bucks, and you got yourself you know a month and a half worth of smokes. Um, nowadays, though, cigarettes are up to about seven bucks or something. It depends on where you buy them, of course. But I mean, I, I see them like um, five fifty a pack, and that's only if you buy a multi pack or something. So I'm like, holy shit, that's like fifty bucks a carton or more. Um, I used to smoke um about a pack a day, you know. So if at that rate, you're talking about three to four cartons a month, and so you're talking about one hundred fifty, two hundred bucks minimum. There's talk in um, certain parts of the world. In New Zealand, they're already up to $10 a pack. Um, uh, and they're talking about raising taxes every year on those cigarettes until they're up to $50 a pack by the year 2020. That's their goal is to make, of course, they're New Zealand dollars. And New Zealand dollars only worth about 75 cents. But, you know, hey, what the hell? It's the right idea. Uh, so it, it does work to moderate consumption, even with a product which has such high inelasticity okay cigarettes tend to have high inelasticity uh, I don't know what that one was and I don't really care uh, oh this is interesting increased materialism yeah um, 
you look at this picture on the left here. This is this is interesting. They asked incoming freshmen, um, how important is it to you that you are well off financially in life? And they asked him a second question. Uh, how important is it for you to develop a meaningful philosophy of life? Okay. And so these fr incoming freshmen answered these two questions. And we see across the bottom, it's 1965, 1970. And you see what happens is that um, there's, there's this increasing... I must be financially well off, and a decreasing having a meaningful philosophy of life is important to me. Um, that's a that's a pretty revealing image. Okay, the materialism is amazing. I mean, I admit I'm a victim. I mean, victim? Hell, I'm yeah, I'm a victim. <laughs> Don't blame me, right? No, uh, I admit I fall for this too. Um, I mean, what I own is I, I'll bet you it's ten times what my parents owned. I mean, seriously. I mean. We got two big screen televisions. We got um, two full desktop computers. We got a laptop. We got an iPad. We got, you know, two iPhones. We got, uh, damn, what else do we got? I don't even know. You know, oh, yeah, we got an Xbox and a Wii. And, you know, it's like, holy shit. You know, we got two full cars. We got, I mean, uh, a 2,000 plus square foot home. I mean, we've got, holy balls, okay? Um, and it's crazy because. We are under this assumption that money will make us happy. And does it? And the answer is no. Hell no. This is David Myers, your your textbook author. This is really what he talks about. This is his work. No. Money does not buy happiness. Period. So you take a look at this graph here on the right side. And basically it's different parts of the world if memory serves. Again, I, I can't see because of the, how small it is on my little monitor here. But we see, I believe it's G. GDP, GNP, gross national product. There you go. The gross national product along the bottom and the b -b 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 happiness, I guess, some way, somehow or another happiness score. I don't know how they measure it. I can't read that. And what you find is that there is some relationship. We see as the gross national product starts at zero and moves towards 10 there, you see a little bit of rise. And it makes sense. You know, money buys happiness. I would argue money doesn't buy happiness. Money staves off unhappiness. But once you get past that point, it basically just sort of flattens out, doesn't it? More money does not equal more happiness. Uh, okay. I'm going to kind of expand on these a little bit. These are these are actually pretty cool. I'm, I, I, I believe... Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, I don't know how much of this I want to get into, but anyway, I'll get into as much as I get into um, so what is this materialism? Where does it come from? You know, it makes a lot of sense because, I mean, we are, we are, again, I mean, we've talked about it, you know, I know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not a caveman, I'm not a, I'm not a monkey, blah, 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 whatever, but we have this evolutionary baggage that is holding us back here, okay, and our ancestors were such that it was their job to hoard things, that's what they were supposed to do, their job was when there is enough, you should take it and pull it, squirrel it away, right? Squirrel it away. You should squirrel it away to you never know what tomorrow is going to look like, okay? You should, uh, and I mean, of course, most of what they squirreled away was food, right? You should. You should save it as much as you buy. If, if there is 500 today and you can only eat five today, you should take eat five and put 495 in the bank, man, somehow or another, because you don't know what tomorrow is going to look like. So we're, we are really, our ancestors really, this was a behavior of our ancestors, which, which increased your survival, period. I mean, those that didn't hoard died, period. I mean, that's that's... That's how it works. I mean, all you have to do is, what was it, the uh, Aesop's fable, the grasshopper and the ant, and the ant works and the grasshopper, and you know what I'm talking about, right? Read Aesop's fables, dude, if you don't know that one. Um, the cultural basis. Clearly, materialism only makes sense in cultures that are sedentary, because um, it doesn't really make sense to be materialistic if you are living in a culture that is constantly on the move, right? I mean, it's pretty hard. All your possessions have to be able to be carried by your horse, right? That's it. That's your main possession is your horse. And if what you own can't be carried by your horse, ah, good luck with that, okay? And since you already have to pull a tent or something, I don't know. How about this one? I'm going to pull this one apart. Does God want you to be rich? I'm going to come back to that one because that, that's a controversial one. That's a real big one. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit more about learning theory in, in these next slides. 
Um, here's an interesting uh, two in a row. These are actually pretty interesting. You should read these two. These came out of um, Scientific American Mind. And uh, in both of these, they're, both, they're a little bit different. But, I mean, they're, they're both basically the same idea that um, when we see things that are valuable or something like that, our brain literally fires a pleasure center. Uh, in this first study, what they did was, you know, wine tastes better if we think it costs more money, right? And I was like, what a surprise, you know. I believe it was five wines, and they were put at different price levels, but it turned out that, you know, there was two pair of them that were the exact same wine, but put out at different prices. And I was like, if you, oh, let's just keep it simple. You have two wines, and if they're exactly the same, but you're told one is $20 a bottle and one is $8 a bottle, you think the $20 one tastes better, okay? And literally, when you drink the $20 one, your brain's pleasure centers um, are, are, are firing up, okay? When you drink the $8 one, not so much, okay? It's the same wine. What the hell are you talking about? And so our brains literally respond to valuable, okay? And here was another one. It was a, a different one, but, you know, when it was a valuable target, our, our brains literally light it up differently, lit up differently, light it up, whatever. Um, how about this? So this was a very interesting article. Um, check it out on Time. It's a Time Magazine article. I, I didn't actually put it up on the blackboard or anything. But uh, it was, what, what does it say? Does God want you to be rich? That was the cover story in time. Um, boy, it was about three years ago now. Um, here's, here's a couple of verses. Some people say, no, God doesn't want you to be rich. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. All right? Or this one, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Okay, and by the way, this is this is a good history lesson. The eye of the needle was actually a, um, referred to a gate in a city. I don't remember which city it is, but uh, they this city which uh, had been attacked, they they had a a security system in place where there was only one entrance to the city, and it was very very uh, heavily guarded, and uh, you were not allowed to bring in 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 these animals because uh, you could hide a weapon inside. I, not a weapon inside the animal, but you know hide your weapons. On whatever, I guess. But anyway, and so you couldn't bring your your animals through, and so getting a camel through the eye of the needle did not literally mean a needle, but meant through this city gate, which is closely guarded. Or here, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. In other words, money just buys pain, right? So some people say, no, God doesn't want you to be rich. But other people, they look at the same stuff and they say, okay, who would want to get in on something where you're miserable, poor, broke, and ugly, and you just have to muddle your way through until you get to heaven? That's interesting. Um, religion is the opiate of the masses. I'll leave that for another class and another discussion. Here, though, but remember, the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. And so can Firms his covenant, which he swore to your fathers as it is today. Okay, so maybe God does want you. This does not necessarily promote greed because it says charity will be rewarded ten times, right? So you're supposed to give back. Now, it is these types of things that are driving some of these mega churches like Creflo Dollar um, and, um, oh, dude, that dude down in, in Houston that scares the shit out of me so bad. Joel Osteen. Joel Osteen. I just refuse to believe he's a good person, but hell, I'm just throwing stereotypes. The guy just freaks me out. Um, but, you know, they have these 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 mega churches where they, they have this, um, you're supposed to, um, I mean, they, 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 they promote Christian charity. Sure, sure, sure. But they basically argue that um, if you're rich, that is the evidence that you have that God does, in fact, love you. Because if God did not love you, he would not allow you to be prosperous, okay? And they don't call it rich, by the way. They call it prosperous, which makes it so much better. All right, how about this? Um, this is learning theory. Uh, say, for example, a dollar. What is a dollar? A dollar doesn't have value. A dollar is a piece of paper. Here's a piece of paper. You want a piece of paper? Here's a piece of paper. Where's my camera? There it is. It's just a piece of paper, right? 
but it's become associated. Think learning theory 101. Think about that. Um, the laws of association. And we find that it's become associated with things such as, like, if I have a $5 bill, I can convert it into a yummy Whopper meal at Burger King, right? I can... Mm -hmm. This equals this. And so the $5 is said to be a secondary reinforcer. It has no value. It's a piece of paper. It has value because of what it's associated with, okay? Now, what happens, though, is that money gets associated with so many things that the money itself begins to represent value to us, okay? It begins to be the very... And I, I mean, I admit it. I admit it. The, I am... Even though I know that I could, you know, use a credit card or whatever, I just feel better when there's cash in my wallet. I just feel better about it. Even though I know it's not what, what's... If I had 50 bucks in my wallet or 50 bucks in the bank, I feel better if the 50 is in my wallet. You know, it just makes me feel good to have it. And um, it's just what it is. Uh, materialism fails to satisfy. Yes, it does. Um, as we said... Getting richer doesn't do it. Here's, in fact, a similar graph to one we saw earlier. But here is um, the the red line is personal income uh, in two thousand in, in you know the year two thousand dollars or something. This was um, I want to say this was not just personal income, but this was um, what 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 do you say the uh, uh, spare money? I guess spare money after you pay your. I forget the word, discretionary money or something like that. And so here's the discretionary money of the average American, and you find it's going doom, 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 straight up, okay? But now look at the black dots there. They they measured how, how the percentage of people that report themselves as very happy. So even though our, our income has shot from $10,000 to $28,000, the percentage of people very happy has remained absolutely flat, okay? Um... This is some strong evidence. Why? Because it doesn't necessarily make you richer. As we get wealthier, we change our comparison group. You know, um, let's say, for example, I, uh, I when I first bought the house I'm in, um, I, I still remember it was just the greatest thing in the world. I could not believe that I was living, that I was going to own, that I was going to live in a house this good. It was better than anything I'd ever grown up in. That's for darn sure. It was better than anything I had ever seen. I mean, really. All right? But you know what happens is I live here. Certainly, it's a nice house. I still like my house. But you know what? I realize every house down the street is the same. Okay? They're all the same. They're all brick houses. Three doors down, it's the same house. Across the street, it's the same house, except it's reversed on their, their house. But it's just the same house. They're all brick and um, I got, you know what, I uh, I still have to count mailboxes in order to find my house. You know, I'm driving down the road, and I'm like, okay, which one's my house? Oh, shit. And so I have to count first, second, third mailbox, second house after the third mailbox. That's how I find my house. Isn't that embarrassing? All right, here it is. But they all look the same. So here's what happens as we, as we, as we, get this wealth, we change the way we compare it, the way we think about it. I am no longer, I, I, I mean, I am, I try to not let this happen, but I, I tend to compare myself to what I've been recently, or I tend to compare myself to my neighbors. My neighbors are the same as me, okay? that uh, The simple statement, yesterday's luxuries become tomorrow's necessities, is true. I mean, what we compare ourselves to. And so I'll give you a little story. This is a really good story for you. Um, uh, when, when I was uh, first married to my wife, I, I can remember it was even before um, my son was born, so it must have been really quite early in our marriage. And uh, we were poor, very poor. And uh, we were living in this little shit one bedroom apartment out in um, Long Island, New York. And uh, it was a garage, in fact. It was really bad. And uh, then what happened was uh, we would go to Burger King once in a while as a big treat, big, big, big treat. And uh, what we would do is uh, we would buy a Whopper Junior meal and split it, okay? Because, I mean, that, that's the poverty level we were at. It was like $4 to buy a Whopper Junior meal out in Long Island. And so we uh, we would split that, and it was it was so sweet, you know? You have the last bite. I'm full. No, you have the last bite. I'm full. You know, it was, it was just really sickeningly sweet. So, anyway... Um, I remember one day, normally my wife liked to get the uh, the cheese on the on the Whopper meal, you know? 
and uh, the Whopper Junior meal. And one day we get there, and they're like, you know, to you want a Whopper Junior meal? Okay, would you like cheese on that? And my wife says, no. And I says, wait, you love cheese on the Whoppers. Why? Why not? I mean, why aren't you going to just get the cheese? She goes, no, that's okay. That's okay. So we get our meal. We go and sit down at our booth. And she reaches into her purse and she pulls out a slice of cheese. She throws it on the Whopper. And I'm like, oh my God. By doing that, what? It would have cost you 15 cents to buy that, to put that on there. And uh, it cost you probably 5 cents minimum for that because it was probably cheap American. So you saved at best a dime. Like 10 cents is what you saved by doing that. And I'm like, okay, you know what? That's just not cool. That's So now... Every time I start to get greedy, every time my wife starts to get greedy, God forbid that doesn't happen, but every time that this happens, I got to tell myself or tell her, just remember the cheese, woman. You just, you think about that cheese. Because if you change your social comparison, you'll be amazed by how wonderful you have it, okay? You just got to change the way you think. It's an attitude kind of a thing. But this is why money doesn't make us happy, by the way. It's good, good stuff. And also, we adapt to it. I mean, this is an interesting one. The tendency to adapt. This is like um, uh, our anticipated emotions. Let's say... If we have something very, very positive, let's say here uh, in this graph here underneath my face, there I am. If we look at the top line, we say, let's say somebody wins a lottery. And what, what it is is um, you ask them, okay, how, how happy will you be in a year or something like that? And so the dashed line going up to the top, they're like, that's how happy I'm going to be in a year. Okay, but the truth is they win the lottery and there's this the blue line up on top. There's this initial spike in happiness, but look at that their happiness level sort of fades right back down to where it started from in the first place. They anticipate it's going to last forever. Same thing with negative stuff. Your house just blew away. You know, a tornado popped it out. Like, oh my God, this is so bad. I think in a year I'm going to still feel this way. But in fact, a year later, it just, it doesn't matter anymore. Okay? So we adapt to whatever our certain, our, our exact situation is. So, um, even when, um, like say, and I, I mean, this is a fact. Even I, I can still remember when I got my uh, first real job, my first professor job, and all of a sudden my my salary went from you know here to here. I was like, holy shit! In the first year, I thought I am just I am rich. I am rich beyond rich. But within a couple of months, well, within a year or something, and you're like, it just became the norm. You just, you get your paycheck, you put your paycheck in, you don't even realize, you don't even think about it after that. Well, here's an interesting one. Uh, again, um, if you click on this link, this will take you to an interesting, very interesting article in um, National Geographic. But uh, this one, this is... Uh, an interesting component. I, I don't know exactly what what to think about it. I just love it so much. I like to incorporate it into as many classes as possible. In um, Bhutan, Bhutan is this little tiny country. I want to say they have a population of about 150,000 people. It's uh, up in the in the Himalayas. Oh, oh, it's near Nepal. Near Nepal, um, north. What am I trying to say? Northeast India, basically, up in there. Um, and. Uh, there was a king, the king of Nepal, uh, king of king of Bhutan, and uh, the king of Bhutan um, viewed himself as sort of like the father of his country or something like that. And um, in that fatherly sense, my job as a father is to um, do the right thing for my children. Okay, my kids say, "How come we can't eat soda for lunch every single day?" And I'm like, "Cause I mean." I, I can't answer that anymore. The answer is because it's not good for them, right? I My job is to see the bigger picture. My job is to do the things that are perhaps unpopular because they're actually better in the long run. And it's my job to be wise enough to see the bigger picture. Well, that's how the king of Bhutan viewed his, his position. His job was to see the bigger picture, to be the wise king that sees what's good for the country, not what's good for the moment. Okay, and so he had some advisors that basically laid it out for him and said, "Okay, look, um, when you when you focus on money, when you focus on on gross national product or something like this, um, if your goal is to raise gross national product as it is in an American, oh my God, don't even start with me. Um, that's not 
going to work, okay? Because that's just temporary. That's just for today what's going to be good, okay? Instead, here's what he says. He, he, he puts together his economic team, I guess if you want to call it economic team, and he basically turns and says, um, our goal is not to maximize gross national product, but instead to maximize gross national happiness, okay? It's similar to gross national product, but it's like, how happy is my country? How happy are the people in my country? My job is to maximize not their money, but their happiness. Now, don't get me wrong. Money is a component of that he, the, the king of Bhutan, went through all and made all of his decisions based on raising gross national happiness. And so let's just take a simple example. There's, there's, there's a forest. I like to do two things. I could either A, open that forest up for logging. And therefore, it would, you know, the logging company would build a road through there that my people then could use to transport goods to market. And um, the, 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 the logging company would, would pay us a, a stipend, uh, not a stipend, whatever, it would pay us for the logs. It would uh, make jobs for my people. I mean, you, you know, it goes on and on and on. Or I could leave it, okay? And people would be happy because of the serenity, okay? And so he would look at it and say, okay, one makes money, but it perhaps starts to make some people unhappy because you've, you've broken the, you, you've broken the landscape up. You've, you've, um, you know, um, Bhutan is a Buddhist nation. They have this oneness with nature kind of a, a, a thing. And, um, you've broken my connection to nature or something, okay? So there are true costs to opening up that, that woods to logging, and there's true benefits to leaving it, okay? And so all decisions are made in terms of which one will maximize the happiness of my people. That's how we did it, okay? What an incredibly cool concept. So he goes along, and uh, here, he's a lot of words here. He goes along, and uh, one of the... Um, one of the one of the things his his economic advisors say is your people would be happiest in a democracy. And he's like, well, so be it then. I and he voluntarily. I believe actually it was his son, his son who took over as king after him. But anyway, they voluntarily stepped aside and changed it from an absolute monarchy to a constitutional monarchy where the king is very little more than a head of state. He's still revered as a very, very wise and very benevolent leader. But he is no longer a king in the uh, true true monar monarchical sense, okay? And it, as he was in the absolute monarchy. And in or it's just, that's unheard of. A monarchy that, that voluntarily chooses to abandon their monarchy? I mean, think about that. Nobody gives up power voluntarily, but their economic advisor said this is a way to maximize the happiness of our people. Okay? So if money doesn't buy long-term happiness, where does a good life come from? Close relationships, faith communities, positive thinking habits. This is a big one. Positive thinking habits. As I told you, um, my particular habit involves... Remember the cheese, okay? Every time I start to get greedy, every time I start to uh, not appreciate things, I just think, think the cheese, baby. And that, to me, is a positive thinking habit, okay? Now, flow is an interesting one. Um, this is a, a, a something that was studied by a guy named Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi. Good luck on spelling that one. The, the name is like 75 letters long. It's just craziness. Um... But anyway, he, he describes this, uh, he says, true happiness does not come from money. True happiness does not come from uh, those things that some people might associate with happiness, like going to a party. No, these are, these are transient happiness. True happiness comes from this thing that he describes called the flow state. Now, a flow state is this, this uh, the state, it's almost a state of mind, it's almost a trance or something like that. Um, I guess you could think about a meditate, meditative state, but it's not just, I mean, a meditative state is, a, is a, an interesting example of achieving flow, but it can also be achieved when you get so engrossed in a task, you get so into it that you lose your sense of self, that you lose your sense of 
you lose your sense of separate identity from the task that you're performing. And this flow does not come from parties or things like that. This flow comes from knitting. I don't know what you do. It comes from perhaps prayer or, or meditation if that's who you are. But it could come from shit. It could come from mowing the lawn if that's what, if you just, it could come from gardening. It could, I mean, whatever it is that you love to do and you're so engrossed in it and so involved in it that you lose track of time and you lose track of self and you're into it. That's the flow state. And that is true happiness according to Mahali Csikszentmihalyi and I think he's on to something. Uh, okay, well, I think I already said this, but I guess I have some slides here at the end, anyway. Um, so anyway, why do we care about the future of the planet? Uh, we're motivated, we already said this, pass on, right. We're motivated, yeah, we're motivated not just to pass on our genetic material to the next generation, but to make sure the next generation also passes along. Yeah, whatever. Uh, religion, we already said it, gift, passed along. Uh... Blah, blah, blah. No, I talked about these. I don't know why I have them at the end here. Uh, well, this is interesting. Here we go. Um, why we care about the future of the planet as a cultural perspective. Again, some of you guys are too young to, to remember this, but back in the 70s, uh, the word environmentalist equaled the word nut job, man. They were just, they were synonymous with each other. Um, an environmentalist was somebody that chained themselves to a tree to prevent the bulldozer from coming through or something. I mean, there was no... The environmentalism was not a word that a normal... It was not an adjective. Environmentalist, I guess. That's an adjective? I don't know what that... I don't... I'm not a grammar dude. All right, give me a break. Um, you would never describe an average person as an environmentalist. Only members of Greenpeace or some crap like that. Environmentalism was a just extreme thing. However, things have changed radically, Okay. There has been a radical cultural shift in, and social rewards and reinforcements have been modified accordingly. And in fact, government mandates have um, come through. And so we find that um, that uh, recycling, like say, uh, here, this, this is, it's an interesting one. Uh, they have a program for recycling Korea that will just blow your mind. They have now changed the thinking pattern of an entire country. Uh, no more disposable chopsticks. It was those stupid little wooden chopsticks. They have, uh, let's say, for example, you go to McDonald's. You don't get a disposable cup at McDonald's. You get a, a regular cup, and then they wash them, and you get a cup, all right? Um, if you want to, let's say, for example, you want to get a cup of coffee to go at the coffee shop. It costs extra to go because if you're at the shop, they're going to use a regular mug, and you're going to and they'll wash it. But if you take it to go, what happens is they have to give you a paper cup. And so it'll cost you 51 or something, like five cents extra. And this five cents, I believe actually you have to pay for the cup, 10, uh, 100 won, 100 won to actually buy the cup. But then there's a 50 won fee that gets tacked on top of that. And that 50 won is a recycling fee. Because the idea is... It, if you take that coffee to go, you're going to take that coffee cup and you're going to drop it into a trash can somewhere. However, what happens is they um, they have a whole class of people that come out at night whose uh, sole form of money is recycling. And um, these people get paid by the government to go out and recycle. And so they'll be going through the trash and they will find that cup that you now threw into the trash, right? And their job is to gather all of that stuff up, okay? And the 51 that you had to pay to take that cup is put into the big pool of money which is used to pay the people to gather that stuff back up, okay? And it's a really interesting. I mean, they, they've gotten so extreme there. Um, it's become such a cultural shift that... Um, you, you just don't think about it. You just do it. It just is. Now, America, we can move in that direction, too. We really can. I mean, culture is a powerful, powerful mo a mover, motivator. All right. So we finished up. Yep, that's it. That's the last thing in this this uh, last thing in this uh, chapter. So here I got a moment. I better. What? Oh, yeah. Here's this one. I better uh, say, hey, it's been a fun class. Can't say I ain't glad to finish this last lecture, though. I'll tell you that much, all right? This is... Ooh, lordy. So, I uh, hope to see...
each and every one of you in person because you've gotten to know me pretty well in all my bad hair days and everything but now I want to meet with you all right so make sure you guys come on in and stop in and say hey I'm and I'm be like I know that name and now I got a face for it so come on in and see me and uh, have a good semester